Presented by Caltech. Our next speaker is Professor Katie Bauman, um, who I just learned just started this week. So congratulations and welcome to Caltech. And she's going to be speaking today. Oh, her background is on computational imaging and machine learning. And she's going to be speaking today about some work that she's done on uh, imaging black hole based on the shadow it leaves on the background of hot gas. So Professor Bauman. So black holes are some of the most mysterious objects that we have in the universe, actually. And they're cloaked by what is called an event horizon, where extreme gravity prevents light from escaping them. Yet the matter that falls onto a black hole, the gas, is actually superheated to hundreds of billions of degrees, so that although light can't escape, actually it, it, it shines brightly as it falls in. And for that reason, although black holes are um, relatively small, they actually can outshine the combined starlight of all the stars in their host galaxy. And so scientists have been studying black holes ever since um, they were first predicted from Einstein's theory of general relativity just over 100 years ago. And in particular, for decades, scientists have been studying the giant elliptical galaxy at the head of the Virgo um, constellation called M87. And this galaxy, which is 55 million light years away from us, is very special. So um, a, while, a long time ago, someone discovered a streak of light on the sky. And this streak of light was a jet of plasma shooting out of the heart of the galaxy and marking the spot of a supermassive black hole. And so for over decades, scientists have built better and better instruments to try to zoom in and study this jet and the supermassive black hole that is predicted to be at its uh, core. And in 2017, an Earth-sized telescope um, was built and, and collected the data that um, was necessary to take the first image of a black hole. And two years later, this is what we saw. So you might ask, though, you know, how were we able to take a picture of something that kind of by definition is unseeable? And there's many different aspects to the story, and I'm just going to touch on a couple of them today. Um, uh, so, so, uh, but there are many different aspects. So this ring of light is actually a, a, a signature of the black hole's event horizon. So because uh, there's extreme gravity around a black hole, light doesn't actually follow straight lines. It's actually curved because of the warping of the space time. So light can even go in circles around the black hole. And because, as I said, that the, the gas is heated to hundreds of billions of degrees, it shines brightly, and you have photons flying around everywhere. And some of them fall into the black hole, but others are, are kind of bent around it. And the net effect is that you have all these photons that are kind of bent around into this circular shape. Um, so effectively, the black hole casts a shadow on a backdrop of, light, of bright material that is nearly circular. And if Einstein was right about general relativity, then this light would be bent to into a ring whose size and shape are, um, tell you about the mass and the spin of the black hole. And this is called the black hole shadow. And simulations of turbulent plasma in the accretion disk and in the jets around a black hole predict that if we had infinite resolution glasses and, uh, and we saw, could see in one millimeter, this is what we would expect to see. But even though you know, we can see the environment around a black hole or we predict that we would be able to see it, taking a picture of this is actually seems nearly impossible. So the size of this ring is really small. It's about 40 micro arc seconds across which is about the same size as a grain of sand, but when it's in New York and we're seeing it from California at Caltech. So very, very small size. And so if you plug in the wavelength of light we need and the angular resolution we need in order to see something, this, this black hole ring, it turns out you need a telescope that's 13 million meters across, or essentially the size of the Earth. And if we could build this Earth-sized telescope, then we could just start to make out that distinctive ring of light that's indicative of the black hole's event horizon. So although we couldn't build a single dish telescope the size of the Earth, instead um, the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration spent over a decade building a computational telescope that's the size of the Earth and capable of resolving structure on the scale of a black hole's event horizon for the first time. And this method of combining telescopes um, actually uses uh, this worldwide network of telescopes and they're linked through the precise timing of atomic clocks. So teams of researchers at each of the sites essentially freeze the light onto petabytes of data and then these, uh, the disks of data are shipped together and computers process it and act kind of like the lens to make the, the final picture. And so there are many different aspects to, to making that picture, 
But my primary role in the project was taking the, the data that had been processed down and then trying to make an image from it. But how, so how do we do that? Well, unlike with a regular camera, the Event Horizon Telescope doesn't actually take a picture in pixel space, but it takes it in fr uh, frequency space. So we essentially take measurements of the black hole images for a transform. And if we covered the, um, if we tiled the entire globe in telescopes, we would sample all these spatial frequency measurements. Um, however, because we only have telescopes at a very few number of locations, that means we only see a few number of measurements. So it turns out that for every two telescopes in the array, we get a single measurement of the underlying image's 2D spatial frequency. And that's related to the projected baseline between the telescopes. So the closer two telescopes that are, the um, smaller spatial frequencies that you measure, so that gets you large uh, spatial structure. And so to measure fine details you need to see that ring, you need to put your telescopes farther apart. But the EHT, in, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope in 2017, um, measured with only, had only eight telescopes in it, but five of them were only at different locations and could actually see the M87 um, black hole. And so with that, that would only be five choose two, which is only 10 points, which is a small number to try to make an image from. But luckily, as the Earth is rotating, we actually sample new measurements. So because the baselines between telescopes change as the Earth rotates, this amounts to carving out these different elliptical paths in the frequency plane, where each point that we're sampling is a complex number with an amplitude and a phase. And so at this point, we have the data, and we kind of can abstract away the astrophysics for a bit and think of it as just a mathematical problem. We have sparse measurements, and our goal is to find the image that caused them. And if we were given measurements, you know, the, if we filled the, tiled the globe, we would get all those spatial frequency measurements, and the problem would be trivial. We would, in the case of no noise, you would just simply need to take the inverse Fourier transform. But because we only have a few samples, that means there's an infinite number of possible images that are perfectly consistent with the data that we measure. And on top of that, we also have a different, quickly changing atmosphere above each of the telescopes that makes it really challenging as well. And the reason why is that the, the, whole, the signal that we get from the different telescopes is we, we really are looking at the time delay between the signals as it, it reaches different telescopes here on Earth. So that time delay is key for extracting that 2D spatial frequency measurement. But when you have a different atmosphere above every telescope, this adds an additional propagation delay. And so that changes that time delay, which really corrupts our measurements. It adds a, a phase error in our measurements um, that kind of scrambles our data. And similarly, it also um, adds an attenuation, different attenuation term. So this is very difficult to deal with in our data. Because ideally, we would have this, we would want to measure this italicized V, which is a, a complex measurement with an amplitude and a phase. But we, but we have scrambled it with the atmosphere. But luckily, because we are working with more than just two telescopes, so remember, every measurement is um, you get from combining multiple two telescopes data together. But because we have multiple telescopes around the world, actually, you see these same corrupting terms in multiple pairs of data that we get. And so by looking at these commonalities, by, by looking, designing algorithms that take advantage of that re redundant corruption, we've been able to design algorithms that solve for the images while also solving for these corrupting terms. And so to do this, we developed essentially two different classes of algorithms to tackle the problem. The first class of algorithms was based on very standard methods used in um, radio astronomy uh, before and developed many years ago. And they're um, work called clean with an iterative self-calibration loop. And the advantage of these is that they are standard methods, so they're very vetted in the community. But the disadvantage of them is that sometimes they're, very, they're sensitive to your initial conditions. And so they can often require guidance from a knowledgeable user on where to put flux, where to put light in your image. Um, and, uh, but, but even so, even though these are traditional methods, they really had to uh, be developed for the Event Horizon Telescope data and modified. And so I want to highlight a number of people who are really essential in getting these methods working on them. But then a second approach that we've been developing, and these are the ones that I've been more involved in, is on forward modeling and doing regularized maximum likelihood kind of um, in inverse um, modeling so, so that we can recover the image. And um, I've been working on these with Michael Johnson, Andrew Shale, and Kazu Akiyama. 
And in this method, we don't just try to find an inverse function that takes us directly from the measurements to an image like they do in the original clean method, but instead we try to find an image that fits the data that we see, but is also likely um, defined as likely under some sort of function of what we think, oh, is a likely image. Um, and so the um, disadvantage of this is that we have to define what is a likely image. And you might ask yourself, well, what is a likely black hole image? And answering that question is kind of hard. But the advantage of these methods is that unlike with the uh, original methods, we can naturally incorporate these different types of errors, that, like the atmospheric error that I uh, talk, talked about earlier. However, both of these problems, both of these approaches to solving the imaging problem have, have a lot of difficulty, and that's because they have to inject some sort of additional information into the problem to even solve for an image. Either in, in this method, they had to decide where they wanted to put light in the image, and this one, you have to define what is a likely image. And, and that in itself, whatever you choose for the, it's going to bias your image in some way. So for instance, we wouldn't want to put, have a preference for ring images and then be really excited that we got a ring image back in the end. So we had to be really careful when imaging. And so the big question we faced in um, dealing with M87 data is how do we verify what we're reconstructing is actually real? And so we tackled this through a multi-step process. And I'll talk briefly about these different steps today. So the first step actually began years before we even had collected data on, uh, from M87. And that was to run synthetic da data tests to check that our methods worked robustly and also to see what kind of features do we see um, that we believe and, and where do we see artifacts and what do those artifacts kind of look like. And so we did this through a number of synthetic data challenges where we'd have a team of people um, generate realistic data sets such that we, like what we would expect to see on the Event Horizon Telescope data. And then this data was distributed to different teams of people who would then use the methods that they had developed or that they were good at using to, to make their best guess at what the, the underlying image is. And then these images were passed off to a team of experts who would look at these images and say, OK, what do I believe is real? What don't I believe is real? And this was following a, a lot of what we ended up having to do for the real M87 data, because we don't know what the true source looked like. And so, but unlike with the real data, we do have the true image so we could compare it in the end. So I want to show you a few examples of images we saw in these challenges to, to show you like, what we learned from them and how it, uh, it helped inform us how to approach the real data. So this was one of the um, submissions on the bottom. It's showing the submissions from one of the challenges. And you can see that even though every, each of these methods is different and done by different people, so the images each look different, but they all share common features. So a lot of them have this, um, they all have this kind of crescent feature that's brighter on the left than the right, but they all also have very different like wispy structures. Some of them have this tail coming down and others don't. And so by looking at the similarities and differences among the images, you can build up confidence and, and, um, and in certain features and not in others. And then we also did crazy kind of images that people didn't really expect at all. Um, and so you know, no one was expecting something like this, but I think it was really important that, that we threw things like this in there to make sure that the methods could see something really surprising and not just recover rings all the time. So that gave us um, confidence that, uh, uh, in our methods. But so based upon these synthetic data tests, we developed actually how we were going to approach the actual M87 black hole data. So we wanted to avoid this kind of shared human bias, like we had done in the imaging challenges, in order to assess common features among different independent reconstructions. So we split about 40 people who worked on imaging. Either they developed methods or they were, um, used, they were good at and experienced at using different imaging methods into four different teams that span the globe. And these teams were not allowed to talk to each other at all. They kind of, we all worked in our independent rooms and didn't talk to each other at all during the imaging process. And we worked in isolation trying to make our best guess at what the image looked like for um, uh, seven weeks, actually. And then after seven weeks, we all gathered together at a workshop and revealed the images to one another. And this is what we saw. So it was actually quite amazing. So each picture is different, as you can see. Um, they all were reconstructed by different methods and different people, but all of them still contain this ring of light that was roughly 40 micro arc seconds across and um, brighter on the bottom than the top. 
And so seeing these images were some of the happiest moments that we had because although we had, you know, I, I had made a picture of my own, I had no idea if I was imposing too much bias in it. And it was not until we saw different images done by different people and different methods that you really built a lot of confidence up in this image. And so here was the image at the end of that day when we averaged the four uh, pictures together and, uh, <laughs> and, and the group of people who were working on the imaging. And without having done this test and having many people reconstruct uh, with different methods, we never would have achieved the same level of confidence we have in the results. But we still, you know, we still could have imposed some sort of human bias uh, in getting that picture. So um, we actually spent the next couple of months essentially trying to break our images to make sure that that ring was real. And so that led to the third step where we tried to objectively choose image parameters and remove humans from the loop as much as possible. And to do this, we developed three different imaging pipelines. So these were different code bases that were designed to make images for, from the data. Um, but usually the, these little, there were different knobs in them are, that are usually hum, but tuned by humans. But we wanted to say, okay, let's try to remove humans from them. And, and instead we searched for the best knobs to recover different types of source structures. So for instance, we generated synthetic data such that the Event Horizon Telescope was instead seeing a disk on the sky with no hole in the center. And we found the best tuning of those knobs so that we could better, best recover that, the, that disk. And then once we had done that, we transferred these exact parameters onto the M87 data. And you can see that that data required us to put a hole in the center. So even though we tried our hardest to make uh, choose the beta so that we had a disk with no hole, the data still required us to have a hole. And doing these simple kind of training testing procedures on many different types of underlying source structures, we saw that our, um, our methods always preferred uh, to put that, make that ring straight shape. And that was true no matter the method that we used or the day that we observed M87 on. And so blurring the images from the different pipelines to some sort of equivalent resolution and averaging them together, we got the image that we showed everyone on April 10th that we really believe the structure. So this is the ring that is brighter on the bottom than the top. Um, but even though we had um, produced an image which we saw among the different pipelines, we still needed to validate it and we wanted to still make sure uh, we were getting the right thing. So actually we spent uh, we went through a number of different validation tests. I'm only going to talk briefly about one test we did, but, you, um, but there are many others that you can um, kind of go into the papers and see more. So briefly, I talked about how we had chosen um, a set of parameters. We tuned those knobs to best recover some sort of synthetic data. But really, why should one set of knobs be any better than another set? They're actually, the knobs kind of define a model uh, of that, that that, that you are using to recover an image or, uh, or the optimization settings. But really, you could have many different sets of knobs that give you reasonable results on synthetic data. And so instead of just using one, we looked at, did huge parameter surveys and tried to find the set of knobs such that gave us reasonable results on synthetic data and then transferred those to the real M87 data. And once we had done that, uh, we could analyze differences in those images. So just to give you a, a sense, for one of the parameter surveys, we looked over hundreds of thousands of images uh, with different knobs, and we chose 1,500 that gave um, good images on synthetic data. And so here is showing a slice of two of those parameters, and green is showing the ones that we had decided as do, being good parameters based upon their performance on a number of different synthetic data tests. And once we had uh, identified these images, we could look at variations across them. So for instance, by plotting the standard deviation of the aligned images, we could see what areas in, in the ring do we have less confidence in, in, um, in the values that we're reconstructing. And by looking at fractional standard deviation, we could see in what areas that we don't trust. So by looking at these, we could see, OK, there's certain areas, like these three knots, where we, don't, where we have less confidence in the exact value that we're recovering, but it's still the variance is much smaller than the, than the intensity of the ring. But really, these areas on the outside, all that wispy structure, you shouldn't believe. But the ring is pretty robust. Um, but so one question you might have at this point is, what did we really learn? Um, did we, for instance, prove Einstein was right? And the short answer is, well, no, we didn't, but we also didn't prove he was wrong either, which is also a, a good thing, too. <laughs> I mean, well, not good, but it's interesting as well. So uh, just to explain maybe how, how one way you can see that is if you take a six, 
fixed size mass, you can calculate the radius you need to compress it down in order to get a black hole. Um, for a non-spinning black hole, this would be the short shield radius. But actually, what we generally expect to see is not the event horizon itself, but actually the, um, the location at which photons orbit around the black hole indefinitely, or they're in stable orbits, but basically indefinitely. Um, and this photon ring is actually lensed out by the extreme gravity. And so for a non-spinning black hole, we'd expect a diameter of about 5.2 times that short shield radius that's kind of telling you about where the event horizon is. And um, for a, when a black hole is spinning, it gets shrinks a little bit. But this is the range of, of um, diameters we'd expect to see for that ring for, uh, for canonical general relativity black hole. But one thing you might notice is th this ring size directly depends on the size of uh, the mass of that black hole. So if you have a smaller black hole, then uh, a smaller mass black hole, then the ring will be smaller in size. And that's actually interesting for us because before the Event Horizon Telescope images came out, there were actually do two different types of measurements of the black hole mass based upon gas dynamics and stellar dynamics that had a discrepancy of 2x. So um, where the stellar dynamics uh, would give an upper bound. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't expect to get a black hole ring size bigger than the yellow ring. Um, but then one thing you can do is you can say, OK, we can ask ourselves, how do we turn this into a test not just of the black hole a size, but also of black holes itself? And we can look at other unusual exotic objects. For instance, wormholes, wormholes also produce shadows. So for a 6.6 .6 billion solar mass black hole, you'd get a, a smaller shadow, though, than the yellow one. And for super spinning black holes or naked singularities, you even get a smaller one. So we have all these different shadow sizes that you, would, you can plot down. And then when you overlay the EHT image on top of them, you see that the image instant, you instantly roll out these other exotic possibilities. And we're left with a ring that nearly perfectly matches that of the stellar dynamical measurement of the black hole for can canonical GR, uh, so that upper bound kind of which means that the black hole um, probably has a mass of about six and a half billion solar masses. So this is just one of the many things we can learn about black holes and gravity by studying this image. Perhaps, but perhaps one of the most amazing things that we saw is that by comparing the picture to simulations scientists have made for years, simulations that predicted emission around the black hole and incorporated multi-wavelength information, we find that the Im image actually looks amazingly like a lot of the simulations that were done. And so by studying this image, we have our best evidence yet of, of black holes exist and a way to study and learn about the immediate environment around black holes, how they accrete matter, how they have, um, uh, impact their host galaxies. And so now that we, you know, this is just kind of the beginning stages, now that we have this extreme laboratory where we can continue to test general relativity, um, learn about black holes, we're thinking about how can we, what are the next stages? How can we improve our algorithms? How can we improve our instrument to study different parts of this? And so um, I'm excited that even here at Caltech in the, uh, later in the summer, we're, having, we're convening people from around the world to talk about the next stage and how we can even not just make images of black holes, but how can we start making movies of black holes by going to space? So with that, um, on behalf of the entire Event Horizon Telescope collaboration, thank you. Thank you. So questions? There must be at least one. My question is, has your team come up with any experiments you can do to help differentiate between Einstein's theory of general relativity and Carver's G4V theory of gravity? <laughs> oh, oh, I, well, um, our resolution right now is about 20 micro arc seconds. So we're trying to get go to higher. Um, so the, the resolution that we get is based upon the um, wavelength of light that we're looking at and also the maximum baseline between the telescopes. So we have a resolution right now for a 40 micro arc second black hole of about 20 micro arc seconds. And so we're going to higher um, frequency measurements, which will in, uh, improve our resolution. And even maybe by going to space, we can try to, by having longer baselines, we can improve it. So I think on, um, I'm not sure the difference in the uh, size of the perturbations across the different theories 
of gravity uh, for the one that uh, you talked about, but I think that this is something where we're trying to improve our instruments. So we can make large, we can rule out large kind of subsets, like for instance, the wormhole um, thing that I talked about, but tiny perturbations, for instance, we're looking at quadrupole moments that you, that, um, that uh, can be added to, to the theories um, that would modify um, the shape of that ring. I think we're looking towards the future of how we can modify our instrument and algorithms to, to tackle those questions. Hi, yeah, incredible work. Um, I was just wondering, I, I read when this first came out that uh, this was the result of like six or seven days of continuous recording from these telescopes or something like that. I was just wondering, what's, what was the size of the raw data that you had to work with? Yeah, so actually usually what happens is we have an observing campaign of 10 days and then because we're um, we're, we're looking at, we're trying to coordinate telescopes around the world, we trigger on five of those days. So uh, roughly, five, I think it's five um, of those days. So we, we want to like maximize the good weather at the different sites. So it's actually a pro optimization problem in itself that we try to solve. Um, but, um, so, but of the M87 data, we had four days of observation. So we didn't observe every, um, let me try to go back and see, show that. So we didn't observe every day of the campaign, but four of the days. And one of the nice things is that you get the same um, ring shape out. I mean, they're not exactly the same, actually. There's some time variability between them. Um, OK, I forgot the question already. <laughs> Just the amount of raw data that you Oh, yes, yeah, OK. So we collect five uh, petabytes of data during that time. Um, it was roughly five petabytes of data, and about a little less than a petabyte was uh, for the M87. So we observe other sources at the same time. So for instance, another black hole, the one at the center of our galaxy we look at, and also other kind of sources that we even use kind of as a calibrator, and not in the traditional sense of a calibrator, but then we can look at our, um, our solutions for um, calibration error on the gains and stuff and, and see if they match. And also it's good science that comes out of them too. But actually what we use for imaging is not, we don't work with the petabytes of data. This is reduced down through a process of correlation and a calibration stage that initially it's at petabytes and then it goes to uh, terabytes and then eventually what we use for imaging is in the megabytes range where you can just email the file. And you can actually download it online now. We have all the data online that we use for imaging and you can try to make your own image. and. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a lot of work that goes in even just, because basically we have this tiny little signal running on a huge amount of noise, and so it's like sifting through a mountain of gravel to find a few little pieces of gold. So th that, th a lot of that sifting is done ahead of time. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, yeah, one, one last question if you want to grab the mic. All right, we can get. Uh, no, because they're recording the session. Wait, you'll, you'll have the mic in just a second. Hi, so I just wanted to ask, um, did you guys get lucky in that we were looking down on the plane of the accretion disk of the black hole so that the image looked like that, or would it have looked like that from any like, pers like vantage point? We got lucky in lots of different ways, so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We got lucky in that the weather was good during observing. We got lucky in that the black hole was the bigger size rather than the smaller size. Um, but also, we, I guess we kind of got lucky with the direction, but we kind of knew that already based upon the jets in which direction. So we, we knew we were gonna, that we kind of got lucky in that sense too. But actually, if you were observing it, so if you're looking at it kind of, uh, we're looking at about 20 degrees. Uh, the jets are coming out of 20 degrees, so you have accretion disk kind of here. And so it's almost face on. Um, and so that makes it so that you have a strong ring everywhere. But because if, if the jets were pointed, if it was more face on, then actually you have the gas, some of it coming towards you and then some of it going away from you. And due to an effect of Doppler boosting, that would make you have a ring that's brighter on one side and very dim on the other. So we wouldn't see maybe as full of a ring as, uh, as we saw here, but you would see more of a crescent shape. And so I definitely was helpful that we see, a, you know, for, you know, um, I don't know, it's, a, it's much nicer that we get the full ring in this case. But, um, but actually seeing it um, at the angle, we, if, we, if we were able to do that, you can um, learn a lot as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.